So what you see behind me basically, the trains come in from China with the big cranes behind me. We overload the containers from one train onto the next train. From here they continue all the way into Europe, to Germany, to France, to the UK. This is where the place is coming together. This is, I think we can say this is where the East meets the West. You didn't want me to say that shit, sorry. That's fine, that's fine. That's the longest thing in East today. Can I keep my East and West in it or not? Because that is my phrase. <laughs> So I'm temporarily back in Bangor, Maine, after being out in, the, in Kazakhstan, on, on the border of Kazakhstan and China, in this place called Horgos. Now, if you've been following my articles on Forbes, or, you know, my blog, or, you know, various other publications that I write for, um, you'll know that I've been in this place called Horgos um, quite a bit over the past two years. Now, mostly I'm, do, I'm there doing research for a book on the new Silk Road and for, you know, basically to gain content for the various articles and, and you know, whatever that I write that makes me the money so I'm able to actually travel and, and go out and do these projects. But um, this time I was there for a slightly different reason. Um, I was there because BBC World contacted me and informed me that they were interested in maybe making this documentary. I mean, based on more, you know, roughly inspired by some of the articles I've been writing about this place. And, you know, they invited me on board and I figured, hey, why not? Let's, uh, let's go back to Horgos. So in making this documentary, um, the first thing about it is that it's not really, you know, this documentary about, about a dry pour, it's not about containers, it's not about TEU, it's not about, you know, international business or trade. This is was fundamentally, you know, a documentary about people and more specifically how development is changing people's lives and then kind of altering, you know, the culture. You could say that Horgos is in the proverbial middle of nowhere. The place sits about two ticks from the Eurasian pole of inaccessibility, which is the farthest point on the planet from an ocean, which is pretty much the definition of remote. You know, it's this development area, we'll, 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 we'll call it that, that sits on the border of Kazakhstan and China, that five years ago, there was absolutely nothing there. You could look at like Google Maps, like aerial footage of the place, and it was all sand dunes. So they're starting from absolutely nothing on the Chinese side of the border is the new city of Horgos, which is meant to be you know, the city for 200, 200 300,000 people within the next few years. On the Kazakh side of the border is this massive dry port called Horgos Gateway, um, the surrounding and special economic zone, which, you know, someday, you know, is supposed to have manufactured areas and kind of this logistics warehousing zone. And then there's the International Center for Boundary Cooperation, which is a free trade zone that spans across the border of China and Kazakhstan. So anyway, you have all these new development projects that are kind of popping up, just kind of like literally growing up out of the desert. What we wanted to do, we wanted to make this film about how these new projects, how people from the outside, you know, coming into this area that up to very recently was where the world ended on both sides. I mean, I mean, the border was closed. This border between China and Kazakhstan was closed um, during the communist period. So you couldn't even cross this border. So this place was very much um, removed 
from the outside world, basically. And now all of a sudden they open up the border and all of a sudden China and you know Kazakhstan started making all these big investments in there. And people start coming into this area. They built this new road that goes through. They build new railroad tracks, new dry ports, new, I don't know, commercial centers. And now all of a sudden this place that, you know, very much used to be in the middle of nowhere is all of a sudden becoming the center of the world place sits really great in the center of the Eurasian landmass, the combination of both Europe and, and Asia. And they're making this place into like this great hub of transcontinental trade. First of all, from the you know, east-west rail lines going between China and Europe and you know, Central Asia and also north-south between Russia and you know the Middle East, Iran, and South Asia, Pakistan, and India. And right in the center of all these, you know, countries and all these markets, you know, sits it's Horgos. So as I've said, Horgos Gateway is this massive new dry port and a dry port is just basically a port for trains and trucks rather than ships. That, you know, sits on the China-Kazakh border. And this is the place where those China to Europe trains, which have been getting, you know, a lot of media coverage lately, try and ship their cargo um, from China-sized uh, rail, li rail lines to the Russian, the CIS size. And I mean, what do they do? They take the containers from like one train, put on another train, and then they go, right? Well, Kazakhstan decided to um, take this logistical event and build a whole economy around it. You know, the thinking here is that, hey, these trains need to stop here anyway. You know, this is a very strategic point, you know, at the border in the center of Eurasia. Let's turn this place into a hub where like, you know, products and merchandise and, you know, farm supplies and food can all be shipped in from like, you know, every corner of Eurasia and then shipped out to every corner of Eurasia. And that's part of the magic of this new Silk Road thing is because it's like putting, you know, manufacturing and distribution centers closer to the markets that they serve. So rather than, you know, making everything, you know, in one half side of the world, like making everything in China and then shipping it all the way to the other side of the world, like, you know, the United States or Europe, what the new Silk Road is doing is building, you know, these new manufacturing and these new logistical hubs that are kind of closer to the markets that they serve. So anyway, so we go go there, we, we film the dry pour, we, we talk to some of the workers and we get all that down in the film. Um, so anyway, we leave the dry port and we go kind of across the street, kind of this area where there's just like shrubs and desert and, and pretty much nothing to, to shoot some b-roll and whatever. And when we were out there, we met this family of sheep herders who just, you know, herding their sheep, you know, right under kind of uh, this horizon of dry port. So this perfect, this gave us this perfect visuals of the kind of the contrast of first of all, having this, you know, state of the art you know, world-class, $250 million, you know, dry port in the background. And these people that were, you know, these, you know, sheep herders who are living the exact same life that they've been living for generations and, and you know, maybe even, even centuries. And right across the street from Horgos Gateway is this new town, which, you know, the idea is someday would be a new city called near Kent. And the place is being built completely from scratch. Three or four years ago, there was nothing there. And as of right now, this place is being built as a new city for the workers who who work in uh, Horgos Gateway, El Tanko, you know, work on the border and, you know, the, the, the various projects uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding the area. And this place is, like, really showing this impact of the Silk Road project. Now, we're not only talking about, you know, you know cross-border trade. Now, we're not only talking about, you know, a dry port and now we're not only talking about you know warehouses but we're talking about a place where people live a place where kids go to school a place where people eat in restaurants a place where people hang out with their neighbors and interact we're talking about the creation of an entirely new community that's being built up around these uh these new development projects so we went to Narcant and, you know, we, we interviewed some people in their homes, you know, you know, one lady made us breakfast and, you know, we, I mean, we actually shanghai her daughter into the film and, you know, made her one of the characters. You know, we kind of just showed the life of what it's like to, you know, exist in this new town that's, you know, being built, you know, in the proverbial middle of nowhere on the border of China and Kazakhstan that's all been built up, you know, from, from scratch. And now the funny thing about filming in Nurkent, really, is that when we showed up and we wanted to film there, it was technically, you know, a day off for the school. And, well, we wanted to film the kids in the school. <laughs> so, so we told the people managing, you know, our plan, they said, uh, no problem. 
no problem. So what they did is they had these kids and teachers come in on their day off to have class, you know, just so we could film it. And from this new town of Mer Kent, we really needed to show, you know, how these, this dry pour and how this, this new development is kind of impacting the local economy. Like what new opportunities are being created for like local manufacturers, for local farmers. And so we went out and um, well, we found a corn farmer. And so, you know, we show up at his farm, you know, unexpected, you know, we all pour out of the van. We walk up, you know, into the farm and say, hey, <laughs> we want to put you on international television. You know, <laughs> we want to, you know, film, you know, how your farm works. I want to, we want to film you, you know, package in the corn. We want to film this, we want to film that, right? You know, the farmer just looked at us and said, okay, no problem. Come back tomorrow. And we came back the next day. And they loaded the corn in front of us. They, you know, plowed the fields. And, you know, we got, you know, footage of all this. We got a great interview with, with the farmer who was, happened to be, you know, extremely well-spoken, right? And, like, like, really was able to communicate, you know, how this new transportation, you know, ecosystem that's kind of, like, popping up from nowhere in the place where he and his family have been farmers for generations and generations is now giving them access to new markets. It's, a whole new Silk Road story. So it was my job on the docu on this documentary to, you know, first of all, you know, you know, share share the storylines, um, give background information, make you know arrangements with everybody, and you know, set everything up. But it was also my job to provide the characters. Now, most of the characters and many of the characters that you know, you know, we use for this BBC film are the same characters that've been in my articles on Forbes, but in my you know blog posts on on Vagabond Journey, and just you know, the people I've been you know communicating and hanging out with, and you know, writing about for the past two years. But how? I actually meet these people. I mean, this is really, you know, my my, my bread and butter as a journalist and, and a writer is, you know, these characters that, you know, I can provide and, you know, come up with. Now, I would like to sit here and say that I have some, you know, well-defined tactics and tried and true and proven, you know, methods and of, you know, coming out, going out to these places in the middle of nowhere and coming up with all these great characters. For the most part, I go out, I talk to people, you know, I blunder through places, you know, I ask questions, you know, I put myself in these kind of sometimes odd situations and basically I just go out and make friends. And so um, how this like really happens was kind of demonstrated like during the filming of, 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 of this documentary with the with BBC. And so we're hanging out I'm in the bar that was in the basement of our hotel one night and I went up to pay for a drink and I'm talking to the waitress there and she's kind of like, you know, where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from the United States. I'm from New York State. And she's like, oh, New York, uh, very beautiful. I'm like, okay, yeah, cool, cool. Oh, where are you from? She's like, I'm from Jarkent. I'm like, oh, Jarkent, that's a very beautiful city. And she kind of like looked at me funny, right? And she kind of misunderstood what I said and she looked at me and she goes, Beautiful? Me? And what am I gonna say here? So I was like, yes, uh, you are very beautiful, right? And, uh, and after that, you know, we, we started talking a little bit. And uh, I realized that her job, like like her other job besides being a waitress, was kind of serving as like this, this human mule, right? Going into like the ICBC, the, the free trade zone, and carry it out. Uh, packages for other people. Now the funny thing about this whole free trade zone is that there's you know pretty strict restrictions on what you can get you know or how much how many products you can take out duty free at any given time. So basically you can basically take out armful of stuff. But people want to go there and they want to buy products to resell in places like Almaty or other Central Asian countries or Russia and make a profit off of it right. But they can't do that on their own. So what they need is that these locals to kind of like go in to, to this duty-free zone, pick up, you know, packages that are already wrapped up. There's a whole industry surrounding this. But basically what we wanted to do was, was, you know, meet this girl in the morning and kind of go through her day about like, you know, what she does, you know, how she does it, how does she get these products, you know, how does she get in, how does she get out, how does she deal with customs and all this stuff, right? And, and so she said, fine, yeah, you can phone me. I'll be on TV, right? <laughs> and so we followed her. We go into we go into the the free trade zone. You know, we go around shopping. I mean, this place is crazy now. When I first went there in like May of 2015, this place is like a ghost town, right? Wasn't many shops, wasn't many people. The place was like real depressed. Not many people were making much money. But in early 2017, 
this place is booming, right? It's like a, a little, you know, carnival of commerce, right? There's a lot of music, there's people everywhere, people from China, people from Russia, people from Kazakhstan, all coming to sell these kind of like, you know, low-end consumer goods, basically, you know, a little well, significantly cheaper than what they sell for other places in the region. So this place is like, you know, it started out this strange dream of building this, you know, cross-border free trade zone on the border of China, Kazakhstan. At the time it was built, there was nothing else out there, right? And it came alive, right? The place is booming, right? They're building up new trade centers, thousands, to like over over 10,000 people are going there each day, right? And this, you know, just, just to see, you know, the difference between when I first went there and now is just, uh, it blows my mind. It really shows you how these developmental dreams can actually become reality. If, you know, the people back in them have enough money and there's enough political will to make it happen. And these Horgos projects are national level projects both, you know, from Beijing and Astana. So you have the top levels of government pumping money into this area. And basically, um, the place will, will be successful by, you know, all of fiat. And so at this point, we filmed all these, uh, all these infrastructural changes and all these cultural changes and, you know, this, this new life that the people in this border area are, are now living or are gradually, you know, moving towards living. But we didn't really show, you know, how things were before, how things were traditionally in this uh, in, in this border area between China and Kazakhstan. So we went way out um, into the steps to film, you know, kind of this nomad family, right? This nomad family who has a herd of, of camels. And they use these camels to transport, you know, their camps, their yurts, you know, all their equipment and supplies between their camps that they, that they move around to um, each season. Right? So we you know, go out there, we show up, hey, we don't want to film your, you and your camels. And, you know, they, they were all for it. You know, they gave us camel milk. And, you know, anyway, you know, they gave us a lot of food and they, you know, showed us around, told us everything about, about what they do. And visually, I mean, it's going to come out, you know. Like, I'm really excited to see how this is going to come out, you know, in the film because it was just beautiful. I mean, you have these mountains in the background, you have this, you know, wide open kind of plain area, and then you have these herds of dozens of camels kind of like coming through and, you know, being, being led around by these, you know, guys on horseback. And I mean, it was just, you know, you couldn't get more of a, of a, of a Silk Road scene than this. Oh, and in the process of that, Check this out. The director of, of the train station, like, kind of somewhat ceremoniously, gave me a medal. And so when I got back to BBC, you know, I you know, showed him my medal, and yeah, they were uh, they were pretty jealous. Uh. It's like credit seats for you. Yeah. This is a present for our CBC company, please. <laughs> this is a special one. It's an absolute honor. Oh, thank you. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> <laughs>